what an incredible relief. I saw a news story that just lightened up my day, which is that the Buffalo Bills safety, Damar Hamlin, is awake and communicating. This is the football player who had a cardiac arrest on the field after a direct hit to the chest and presumably had a cardiac arrhythmia, which caused him to go into cardiac arrest, but was resuscitated afterwards, who had been comatose until today. This is January 5th. I'm recording this on my commute home from work. So I'm a neurologist and I just wanted to share my experience doing consultations on people who had a cardiac arrest and just to kind of explain the incredible variation of outcomes and I'm just so glad for Damar and his family and his team it's a beautiful uh, thing and you know I got to say the medical staff did an amazing job it's not easy to do CPR on a football player they have pads you got to get everything out of the way and start chest compressions right away but they recognized it was serious they recognized he was pulseless pulseless they started CPR they used Used the anterior external defibrillator and apparently he had another cardiac arrest later on and was resuscitated again and is still awake and talking. So just to give a little background, people have cardiac arrests for various reasons. You could, for instance, have a drug overdose, you could have a heart attack, you could have a cardiac arrhythmia due to a variety of heart problems such as heart failure. You could have another medical condition that puts stress on the heart such as a pulmonary embolism or sepsis or you could have an electrolyte abnormality or whatever it might be but for various reasons the heart can stop. Now if the heart stops for a prolonged period of time and there's no blood flow to the organs all of the organs will fail and at a certain point it will become irreversible. There's just too much damage to the heart, to the lungs, to the liver, and even the heart won't start again if there's extensive damage to the heart because if your heart isn't beating, you aren't getting any blood flow through your coronary arteries to the heart itself. And so that's why we don't really attempt CPR forever. You know, after a certain period of time, it's just hopeless. There's no chance of recovery, so doctors will eventually give up. Now, I have seen people who had CPR for quite a prolonged period of time, even for an hour, and still have a good neurological outcome. And why is that? Well, I remember I was doing CPR when I was an intern on one of my own patients, and the patient happened to have an A-line, an arterial line, and I was doing chest compressions, and the blood pressure was 140. So literally, I was causing a blood pressure equal to what the heart itself can produce. So effective chest compressions are effective. If you push hard and fast enough, you can keep the blood flowing to the brain. Now in the real world, particularly in an out of hospital cardiac arrest, people don't recognize the cardiac arrest immediately. They may not know how to do CPR. They may be scared. They may, there may be a delay. They may not be pushing hard and fast because they're afraid to do damage to the person. Of course, it doesn't matter. You know, once someone has a cardiac arrest, just push as hard as you can, break as many ribs as you can, do anything you can to keep the blood flowing to the heart and brain. But of course, it's very good that there were medical professionals responding to Damar rather than a random layperson because they knew exactly what they were doing. Uh, so anyways, it is possible to have CPR for a prolonged period of time and still have a good outcome. Now, unfortunately, if there isn't good blood flow to the brain for a period of time, even as short as five minutes, if there's no blood flow to the brain, irreversible damage can occur. So even if the heart comes back and the liver and the kidneys come back, the brain is a very high metabolic demand organ, and so irreversible damage can occur quite quickly. What is happening on the cellular level? Well, unfortunately, we don't have any mechanism to turn the cells in the brain off. So even when the heart stops, the brain cells are still operating and they're still creating energy. And what happens if you're not getting sufficient oxygen and blood flow is you get swelling of the cells and eventually lysis of the cells, and that is irreversible. And so to a certain extent, you just have cell damage and certain areas of the brain are more susceptible than others, like sometimes people who have a more prolonged period of low oxygen can have certain areas of damage to the brain, such as in the basal ganglia. I actually have one patient who unfortunately developed anaphylaxis after a bee sting injury and recovered.
recovered after a cardiac arrest, but unfortunately had some damage to the basal ganglia and had a movement disorder afterwards, even though that they survived and, and could walk and had decent cognitive function, they had a, a fairly significant motor disorder. So I just want to kind of explain the range of outcomes after a cardiac arrest. The worst outcome would be brain death, which would be having no cerebral function whatsoever. So if there's very severe injury to the brain, the brain, the entire brain is injured, it swells up, and then it further blocks blood flow to the brain because the carotid and vertebral arteries are not able to overcome the increased pressure from edema, and you just get total infarction of the entire brain, and even the brain stem is not functioning. And so the person is unable to breathe on their own. They need the mechanical ventilator to push air into the lungs. They don't have a corneal blink reflex, so you can touch the cornea with a cotton swab and they don't blink. There's no pupillary light reflex. You shine light into the eyes and they're dilated and fixed. And there are no other signs of cerebral function. They may still have spinal cord reflexes, such as a deep tendon reflex in the knee, but no sign of cerebral function at all. In fact, people can even get hormonal abnormalities like an absence of thyroid and growth hormone because even the hypothalamus is not functioning because it has died. In a less severe brain injury, someone could recover but be in a persistent vegetative state. In other words, they are unable to initiate any voluntary activity uh, or show awareness of the environment, but they can breathe on their own. They may have brainstem reflexes and swallowing reflexes and withdrawal to pain, but they're in a vegetative state. Uh, in a higher level of function, people can have a minimally con conscious state. In other words, they have a profound neurological injury. They may not be able to walk or talk, but they may be able to make eye contact or turn towards someone's voice. And then, you know, people can have various degrees of cognitive problems after a cardiac arrest. Uh, for instance, I've seen a patient who had a cardiac arrest and they had a change in personality, sort of a, a childishness uh, afterwards. And, you know, they may have slow improvement over time. I've seen some people who have mild cognitive problems that may improve slowly over time, but have some residual cognitive problems that may be long-standing. Now, obviously, I don't know anything about Damar's situation, you know, uh, but what they reported is that he's awake and he was able to communicate with writing and he was even able to ask with writing what the outcome of the game is. And to me, that shows fairly good cognitive function. Now, he may still have some problems with his lungs, and at the time I saw the interview of his medical doctors, he was still on a mechanical ventilator. Sometimes, after you have a cardiac arrest, uh, people may have you know, secondary problems like a pneumonia. Often they'll do cooling after a cardiac arrest. They'll use ice packs and cooling machines to decrease the body temperature. And there's some evidence that this can decrease the risk of anoxic brain injury or injury due to low oxygen in someone with a cardiac arrest. And so they may have done this and there is unfortunately an increased risk of clotting and infections from this. And it may sort of slow the recovery overall even though it's good for the brain. I don't know if they actually did this. But obviously there's some reason for the mechanical ventilator. He may still have some lung problem, maybe secondary to pneumonia or flash pulmonary edema from the cardiac arrest. I don't exactly know what's going on. Uh, but I would imagine if his lungs are good and he's alert, they're going to take him off that ventilator very, very soon. And so what would you do if you were the physician evaluating someone who had a cardiac arrest and is waking up? Well, first you would communicate with them, give them something to write on, you know, have them ask you questions, try to explain the event, and then you would test them a little bit. You know, you might ask them, what is the year? Who is the president? You know, what are, what is your, are your parents' names? What is your phone number? What is your address? Just to kind of assess their cognitive function. Then you would go on and do a physical exam. You would look at the brainstem reflexes, see if the pupils are real active, if there are normal extraocular movements, if they could smile, if they could move their limbs, if they have normal coordination, normal sensation, normal reflexes, that kind of thing. They say that he is neurologically intact, which I presume means that his neurological exam is normal, he has 
normal strength, normal eye movements, normal facial movements, no sign of any neurological injury whatsoever. And I have to say, my experience in someone who has a cardiac arrest but wakes up quickly uh, and, and looks good, and you know, you may not have 100% cognitive function waking up from a cardiac arrest. My general experience is the prognosis is extremely good. It's unlikely someone would have you know, subtle cognitive deficits years later, months later, when they wake up so dramatically. That's just my personal experience. Obviously, I can't comment on DeMar specifically. And so, you know, those are sort of the range and outcomes, and it's clear that DeMar is doing very well. He's extremely lucky, and it could have gone a different way. So why did he do well? Well, one thing is probably he does not have some kind of terrible structural heart damage that caused the cardiac arrest. Um, you know, I was not so familiar with this phenomenon, but many people are speculating that he had commotio cordis, which is developing a cardiac arrhythmia after chest trauma, which is extremely rare. I've never seen this in my career, but it has been reported in various athletes. Obviously, it's an extremely low probability fluke event. But the nature of commotio cordis is that there's no structural heart damage and that the heart is fine and essentially that force just triggered the arrhythmia but there's no long-term damage to the heart. Now people were also speculating that something else could happen maybe he could have had an aortic dissection or maybe he could have pericardial tamponade or something else or you know pulmonary embolism or something else causing the cardiac arrest. I think that is mu much less likely. I think uh, cardiac arrhythmia is most likely just given the fact that they were able to resuscitate him quickly. When there's something else causing a cardiac arrest that's less reversible, the prognosis is worse. The fact that it happened when there were medical professionals that were able to respond right away and get on the chest and do those chest compressions right away, right when they felt there was no pulse, I think was critical. And again, it's not easy to do CPR on a football player. And I'm sure they practice this, getting the pads off, starting CPR right away. And the fact that they were able to get the anterior external defibrillator and use it and interpret it correctly, and that he was lucky enough to have a shockable rhythm, ventricular fibrillation or pulseless ventricular tachycardia, and shock him and get a spontaneous return of circulation relatively quickly is probably the reason for the, the good prognosis. So anyways, I was really happy to see this news story. I'm glad he, he's doing well. I hope he makes a full recovery. And can someone return to playing football after they've had a cardiac arrest induced by a tackle? I would defer that question to a cardiologist. It might be an unanswerable question because this just isn't something we have experience with. How could we give an evidence-based answer to this? Just like a boxer who experiences a subdural hematoma or bleeding over the surface of the brain, what is the risk of it recurring? We don't know. And so it's really difficult, uh, but obviously that's not his main concern at the current time. Uh, so let me know what you think about the situation or if you have any questions about cardiac arrest and anoxic brain injury in general. You know, I could talk about like a few other stories I've seen uh, just to give some examples. You know, sometimes cardiac arrests happen for absolutely no clear reason. I remember when I was a neurology resident, I actually was covering pediatrics and I had one patient who was a, a 10 year old who had no medical conditions and no risk factors and had a random unexplained cardiac arrest and had significant anoxic brain injury from that. And it was just devastating to the family and it was horrible. And the cardiologist could give no explanation. All testing, the echocardiogram and everything was completely normal. And his heart was working fine after the cardiac arrest. It's just that his brain didn't recover. Uh, you know, I've had, you know, patients who had severe COVID-19 and they may have had a cardiac arrest during the course of their hospitalization or they had brain injury just from very low oxygen, from severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, even without a cardiac arrest. And, you know, people have had some subtle cognitive symptoms, but made a pretty good recovery long-term in some cases. You know, I've have had a patient actually have brain death as a consequence of acute respiratory distress syndrome from COVID-19. 
Um, you know, even though they were able to recover from the illness, unfortunately, they had permanent brain injury. And, you know, I've seen people with varying degrees of brain injury for various things. But again, any other questions, please post in the comments below or if you have suggestions for future videos.